Well, hello, my fellow Covidians. Like most of you, I'm bored. What do you say we make something that's going to require seven setups, three fixtures, and will be a real pain in the butt to reference for our work origin? Yep, you guessed it. The mainspring housing of a 1911. Now, if you're a gun nut, you know what this is. And if you're not a gun nut, let's just go with that it's a very challenging part with lots of learning opportunities. And in case you were wondering, this is a 1911 in kit form. So without overstating the obvious, the primary mission of the mainspring housing is to actually house the mainspring, which is this guy right here. It fits down inside the assembly and then is depressed and held in place by a mainspring housing pin that fits in this hole and then is held into the frame. Whoop, safety check, looks clear. Fits into the frame like that and is held in place with a mainspring housing pin for the frame. With a mainspring housing pin for the frame. One thing I found very interesting in studying this part in its relationship to the frame is that there was actually a fair amount of wiggle room in this. I thought, well, maybe it's just because there's not a spring load on it. I checked both of my other 1911s and found that there actually is, in all of them, just a little bit of wobble in there. So there's an opportunity maybe to see if we can take that out. Now you can buy these parts all day long on the interwebs, but why in God's green earth would you buy a part when you can make one for at least three times the cost? Why? Because it's custom. And the great thing about a custom part is that we make ourselves is that once we've met all the design constraints of the fit and form and function of the part, we're free to do just whatever we want to do with it. You can change the type of pattern that you have for the grip. You can inscribe certain things on the backside, like I heart you, Mom. So let's get started. So I started this adventure by downloading a full set of plans from Rio Benson. They're available on the internet for free, and I will leave a link in the description. Mr. Benson has done an outstanding job documenting the 1911 from a dimensional standpoint, and I was very impressed with his work. So this is the drawing that I started with, and after a few scotches, I mean hours, I had the part modeled. So this fixture was made from a 4-inch set of Monster Jaws from MonsterJaw.com. Hashtag not sponsored. By the time I got down to designing this fixture, I may have had too much scotch. So enough of all the details. I know you guys are here to see chips, so off to the Tormach. Because we are unable to make sharp corners inside of a pocket with an end mill, we have to remove the material from the corners using a drill. I wanted a way to align the soft jaws together when I placed them into the vise, so I'm drilling and boring two quarter inch holes that I will press fit pins into. Ladies and gentlemen, number five in your tool crib, but number one in our hearts, the Lakeshore Carbide Two Flute Quarter Inch End Mill. Hashtag not sponsored. This tool is my Billy Baru for aluminum. If you're not familiar with Proven Cut, it's another design innovation product from Johnny Boy Saunders and his crew of untouchables at the NYC CNC. I've run five or six of these recipes, and what I can tell you is all of them have been right on the money and much, much better than anything I was running. And look at those chips fly. Now that's the ticket, Cricket. So while we're waiting, how many of you have stopped to go check your 1911 for slop in the mainspring housing? Just curious. I am wondering if the slop or play in the mainspring housing has any impact on accuracy, especially when shooting with one hand in a service pistol match. Feel free to comment on whether or not you found any play in your 1911, and two, if you feel that it has any impact on accuracy. I'd love to know your thoughts. Now I'm cutting that 78 thou slot for the rib that runs the full length of the part. I didn't have a mill cutter that was small enough to cut that slot, so I widened it, hoping that the clamp force would be sufficient to hold the part. Yeah, no. Here at Last Bastion Labs, we always have an MDP, or Master Diabolical Plan, and a backup plan, and if all else fails, an escape plan. I decided while I was at it, 
I would drill and ream 160 thousandths hole for locating pins if in the event that I needed them. This would be backup plan number one. Moving on to our 2D contour to clean up the edges. And finally, to make it look cool, a little chamfer to break all the edges. Our test fit. And this wobble is going to come back to haunt me. And there she is. One side down, one to go. Now I know what you're thinking. Wow, Tim, that's an awful lot of stock for a little tiny part. And you would be correct. But here in the great state of Michigan during the COVID crisis, running out to get stock to make gun parts is not considered to be essential. So I made it with what I had on hand. I've switched to the three flute half inch Lakeshore Carbide Cutter. Considering how much material I have to remove, the Tormach Shearhog probably would have been a better option from a material removal standpoint. However, my shop is in my basement and I do most of my machining at night while my family is sleeping. And if you want to keep your happy little home machine shop, don't wake up the family. Now it's time to make that 160 thousandths hole. I'm using an undersized bit and we'll come back in with the reamer to bring the hole to size. I call this the Jesus hole because most of the critical dimensions are referenced from this hole. Now we'll check the fit with a 160 thousandths gauge pin. And considering I haven't deburred the hole or anything, I think we'll go with that. So with that, operation number one is complete. I'm not entirely unpleased with the part. Next, we'll set it up to take off the cap. And a quick deburring of the part and cleanup. Please don't tell my wife I possess this type of power. On to operation number two, removing the top cap and bringing the part to final size. I did this fixture offline. I figured by now that you've gotten the gist of what it takes to make a fixture. I should point out that I'm not using the feeds and speeds from Proven Cut. At this point, I really have this half inch cutter dialed in for great surface finishes. I think the next time I run this part, I'm gonna run it with the adaptive using the Proven Cut and use this dope for finishing passes. And check out that surface finish. Lastly, I'm using a ball end mill cutter and a parallel tool path to put that chamfer on the part. And we're done with operation number two. I'm very pleased with the surface finish. My master diabolical plan when I was designing this fixture was to indicate off of the upper left hand corner of the soft jaws to set up my work origin. As I thought about it longer, I remembered rule number one of, of soft jaw fixture design, which is always indicate off the part when you can. Tappy tap tap. Yes, I'm still using a wiggler. I did have a digital touch probe in my cart and was getting ready to pull the trigger on that bad boy when the whole COVID chaos began. And in reality, I'm not a production shop. I'm just a guy whittling parts in his basement, so I decided I'd save my money. Luckily for me, there was just enough surface on the part for me to pick up my Z-height. And now we'll come in and clean up that shoulder. Wow, that was a lot of work for one little cut. <laughs> Welcome to machining. And there you have it. 
on to the next stop. I watched a monkey hump a football once, and I'm sure that wasn't near as entertaining as watching me try to get this part into the vise. Now to quickly pick up our work origin and make a junk part. Wait for it. Wait for it. And there you go. Crapazoids. Guess we'll try it with a little bit more meat. I really have no idea why I had it in my mind that I needed to place the part so far into the fixture when I was designing it. Maybe it was too much scotch. Now I'm adding the 1 16th hole and a 60 degree chamfer. Again, in the beginning, my master diabolical plan was to actually drill the 160 thousandths hole used for the mainspring first, and then come through and put the 16th inch hole in the part. However, because the pin hole passes through the side of the mainspring bore, the drill wandered off to never, never be right land. Drills don't like side loads. Apparently, I missed that lesson at the drill academy. And... No, it was not too much scotch. In operation number five, we are cleaning up that little round that's in the part and also providing some clearance in the part for our drilling operation for the mainspring. Now our center drill and you'll notice off camera that I had run a pilot hole through this part before doing the final dimension. That doesn't sound right. Does that sound right to you? No, that's not right. So after I hit the emergency stop, I went and emailed the village idiot and asked if he wanted to meet for a couple of soup sandwiches. So what you just witnessed was the arbor actually separating from the Jacob's Chuck. My guess is that this arbor is on a Morris taper and what we know about Morris tapers is they do not like side loads. It didn't sound right. Off camera I drilled a pilot hole to remove some of the material and that went the full length of the depth without a problem. I came back in with the 280 thousandths drill and as you saw and heard it didn't sound right it didn't look right the part didn't move but it just was not aligned correctly in my next attempt I loaded the uh, same drill bit up into a ER20 collet ran the same tool path the same feeds and speeds and it worked like a charm so my guess is that I have some type of run out in my Jacobs chuck that I'll have to check. So this is the very first part that I ran and I ran this one off camera to prove out the tool path. And back to that little wobble that I said would come back to haunt me. My original plan was that the clamp force would be sufficient to hold this part in place as we were drilling that uh, 280 thousandths hole. And uh, as soon as the drill bit came in I watched the part cock over, I stopped and started over. My fix for that was I rechucked the fixture back into the machine and bored in two quarter inch holes so that I could press fit some quarter inch pins that I cammed over on one side and added slots to so I could adjust into the part. I also drilled clearance holes through the back side of the part so that I could actually knock the pins out if I decided that didn't work. And as you can see that did a much better job of holding that part in position. Also now that I'm done I can wrap a rubber band around this and that fixture stores very nicely. I know finally op number six. This is a profile section where we're bringing the back strap of the mainspring housing to size. I'm sporting a Shars quarter inch four flute ball end mill cutter 
running at uh, 10,000 RPM, 50 inches per minute with a 5,000 step over. For you non-machinists, that means that for every pass, the cutter advances to the side by .005 of an inch. Yes, sir, that is grade A, made in America, machine porn. I'm blowing up the backside so that the knurling will be easier to see. Now it's time for some texturing. I'm using an eighth inch 90 degree chamfer tool from Lakeshore Carbide, running at 10,000 RPM at 50 inches per minute. I'm scratching in the pattern for my first pass with a 5,000 depth of cut. Getting back to the wobble in the mainspring housing with the frame, no matter what camp you're in on whether it affects accuracy or not, never ever underestimate the power that you have of getting in someone's dome by mentioning the fact that there's wobble in the mainspring housing right before a match. That's coming along very nicely. Our next pass will be at ten thousandths. As you can see I'm using the blue to kind of gauge on how pointy those tips are. I'm going to try one more pass at 15 thousandths. So for our final operation, we're going to come through and just finish rounding out this corner and taking up a just trying to take off a little bit of that uh, edge or burr from the actual uh, diamond pattern. This is a parallel tool path. Spinning at 10,000 RPM at about uh, 20 inches per minute. And as you can see, it makes pretty quick work of that. Now that's the ticket cricket. As you can see, those uh, blue tips of the diamonds have almost all but disappeared. That's about what I was shooting for. And there she is, a completed mainspring housing. Not entirely unpleased with the whole process. I have a nice straight hole. Looks correct. I have a little stoning to do on this edge through here. I haven't done that yet. The etching on the back, what I was trying to go for was the uh, standard uh, diamond pattern that you see on a lot of the older original Colts. Now, I'm pretty sure that when they made this part out of steel that they were stamping that. The cutter is always perpendicular to this surface right here. So as it gets along onto the back side, this way, that cut actually gets a little cattywampus. It gets a little bit more on this side and takes a little less material on that side. In a perfect world, we'd have a fourth axis and we would keep the cutter perpendicular to the work and that would make a beautiful diamond pattern down the backside. But as of today, we don't have that kind of capability, but stay tuned. Well, let's run a test fit. So dimensionally, this part came out uh, to the print with the exception of one dimension, which was my fault and I fixed that. But this part does fit in the weapon. It really does. There we go. By the way, safety check. There's a little bit more play in this than I would like. So some opportunity again there. This is a prototype part. This will actually never make its way into a real functioning firearm. But for a first attempt, it does feel good. 
I think that dog's going to hunt. So what's next? 4140 steel. Anyone who is a pure 1911 connoisseur knows that this part has to be made from steel. And so that's what we'll be doing next. So before we can cut steel, we need to have some idea of what our feeds and speeds and type of cutters we're going to use because our aluminum cutters aren't going to work very well. Knowing that I was cutting 4140 steel, I went to Proven Cut, looked up 4140 steel Tormach. It told me the cutters I needed from Lakeshore Carbide. It gave me the feeds and speeds, and I went ahead and ran a test part. And everything went exactly as it was supposed to. Look at the surface finish on that part. I got my 280 thousandths hole drilled without a problem. I tested my diamond pattern with my diamond cutter. And dimensionally, the part came out correctly. I'd like to thank you very much for your time. If you enjoyed what you saw, please hit the like button. And feel free to subscribe. This is Tim from Last Bastion Labs, your safe space for makers. Have a great day.